Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon fired on the same day. How about them apples? You know, when I first heard about Tucker Carlson, I wasn't planning on talking about it here today, but then I had at least 20 people throughout the day ask me if I was going to talk about it, so guess that means I have to talk about it. Do I have a big picture takeaway from this thing? Yes. This is another nail in the coffin of a cable news industry that's been circling the drain for well nigh 20 years now and it cannot die soon enough, frankly. Do I think it was a firing and not a quitting or a mutually amicable separation, if you will? Yes, I think it seems pretty clear that it was, in fact, a firing. Do I think it's related in any way to the Dominion case? I think it probably is. My best guess, knowing what we know right now at this moment, is that management said something to Tucker like, well, since your reporting helped get us into this $780 million hole that we have to climb out of now, it's only fair that you should be a team player and take a pay cut, right? And if you're Tucker Carlson in that moment, you're probably saying, wait a minute, my show gets not just the best ratings on this channel, but in the entire cable news industry, and it's not particularly close. Some nights I get more viewers than the whole primetime lineup on our two competitor networks combined, which is to say, no, I don't think I'll be taking a pay cut at this time. So if you intended this as some sort of ultimatum, I think this is the part where you fire me. So best of luck in your future endeavors, Mr. Fox News. Because here's the thing about making your living in a dying industry. Fox News needed Tucker Carlson a hell of a lot more than Tucker Carlson needed Fox News. This is a man who enjoys more public trust and credibility with his audience than any other man who talks about politics for a living. Anything he decides to do, people will watch it, and they will pay good money to watch it. If Tucker Carlson set up a webcam in his spare bedroom and started doing a one-hour YouTube show each night, that show easily would pull more viewers than whatever new show that Fox News decides to stick in, in the 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific time slot to replace him with. Because this is a whole new world now. This is a world where you can do political monologues and satirical short-form videos for a living, and you don't have to be limited to the opportunities that are available on broadcast television and cable television. You can build a whole media empire without television even being part of it at all. Remember the offer The Daily Wire made to Steven Crowder a few months back? That offer wasn't for all that much less money than Tucker Carlson was making up until yesterday for having the number one most watched show on traditional cable news. Joe Rogan makes more than Tucker Carlson, and all that guy has to do is go sit in his home studio and talk into a microphone for an hour each day. And however much Joe Rogan is worth for sitting and talking into a microphone, Tucker Carlson is worth more, and quite a lot more, in fact. Look. I know Rogan is insanely popular for reasons that I frankly don't understand, and more power to him, but I just don't get it. He sounds like an ignorant, drooling moron much of the time when I hear him, but that's neither here nor there. But Tucker Carlson, on the other hand, he's actually a smart guy with some useful insights to offer. You could make a pretty compelling argument that he's been doing himself actually a financial disservice by staying in the cable news game for so long when there are other better, more lucrative professional vineyards in which he could be toiling. As for Fox News, how about let's stop pretending it's a conservative outlet just because they have a couple of conservative commentators? Fox News is not a repository of conservative ideals any more than the Republican Party is. Taken on balance, the editorial bent of Fox News is probably only 10 or 15 percent less leftist than the openly leftist news channels. Which is another thing they have in common with the GOP. You see, conservatives, conservatism isn't about any ideas or principles. It, it's not about presenting any sort of internally consistent worldview. It's just about maintaining a certain respectful distance between yourself and the radical left lunatic fringe. Which is how you wind up with the Republican Party in 2023 that is to the left of where the Democrats were in 2008. And what is to become of poor Don Lemon? We can't forget about Don. I don't think that guy has much of a future in the podcast game, since the next original thought he has it will be the first one. He's not even that good at re reading a teleprompter, frankly. But oh well. At least he's got multiple sexual harassment lawsuits with, with which to occupy his time. And speaking of people who are credibly accused of sexual harassment, Jim Eagle's going to hit the music for you now. <laughs>
from high atop the battlements of Castle Kermudge, nor rubbing your genitals stank in a stranger's face in a bar is just our fun way of saying hi, pleased to meet you. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. Welcome to the program. I'm your eponymous host and humble servant. And if there is no objection from you fine people, I would like to open with a small anecdote from the weekend. Went into my local 7-Eleven on Saturday, walking down the aisle, going toward the beer cooler, and a guy passes me carrying a 12-pack of Bud Light. I don't think I actually said anything out loud. I think it was maybe just a just the slightest little scoff, maybe a little roll of the eyes, just enough for him to get the sense that, hey, buddy, I, I see you buying that Bud Light, and I am here to shame you for it. So we pass each other. I think nothing else of it. Proceed over to the cooler. And then I notice that the guy I had just passed, he is now right behind me. And he's opening up the cooler, and he's putting the Bud Light back inside and grabbing a 12-er of Coors Light instead. And he gives me just, just a little head dip and says, Thanks for the reminder. And here you go, ladies and gentlemen, a, a powerful story about the value of shame as a community standard. When you're doing a thing you shouldn't be doing, it is up to the other people in the community to see the problem and address it and help keep your ass on the straight and narrow. The guy at 7-Eleven, he had lost sight of the standards of his community, specifically the standard that says decent God-fearing Americans do not buy Bud Light. He was about to absentmindedly do a thing he wouldn't have been doing if he had thought about it, and there, coming to his rescue, saving him from taking his hard-earned money and putting it into the pocket of Dylan Mulvaney, reminding him of the values of the community, was yours truly. And speaking of Dylan Mulvaney, it would seem that he is now the new George Soros, or the new Voldemort, if you prefer, the name you are not allowed to say without committing algorithmic suicide. A lot of crazy stuff on YouTube this past week, as I'm sure you are already aware. Big, major, high-profile channels getting demonetized, people getting whole scads of videos pulled down, and it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out exactly what probably happened here. Anheuser-Busch, they are in the middle of a full-on commercial meltdown. Nobody is buying their beer as well they shouldn't be. They pull the desperate, flailing gambit of throwing together some clumsy patriot porn video. Remember the Clydesdales? Remember 9-11? Remember U.S. flags waving in slow motion just like a Michael Bay movie? Remember how you felt about our brand before we did that stupid thing with the guy in the dress? Which, of course, didn't work and just made matters worse because that's what tends to happen when you try to resolve a public relations disaster by insulting the intelligence of your customers, even worse than you did in the first place when you caused the initial public relations disaster. So this thing was going badly for the Belgians who own Anheuser-Busch. So badly, in fact, that they were left with no avenue of damage control except to call up YouTube and start making demands. I want to see some videos ban hammered. I want to see it pronto, or else we are taking all of our delicious advertising dollars back with us to Brussels. Capiche? So yeah, if you're a content creator who's had a little bit too much fun at the expense of Bud Light and Dylan Mulvaney these past 10 days or so, there is a non-zero chance that you've already had a video ban hammered. You may, in fact, very well be serving out a community guidelines strike as we speak, because Dylan Mulvaney is basically... A religious figure at this point, he who must not be named or criticized or subjected to any sort of reasonable scrutiny whatsoever. So, for example, if I were to sit here and talk about the fact that six years ago Dylan Mulvaney was making weepy Instagram videos apologizing for his white cisgender privilege, that means I am guilty of a transphobic hate crime. That means I am attempting to commit genocide against the LGBTQIA EIEIO community. Because there are only two options available. You either have to love Dylan Mulvaney unconditionally and lustily cheer him on as he makes financially commoditized mockeries of women and womanhood, or else you are a fifth filthy, disgusting bigot. He is not the one engaged in offensive behavior here. You are. Now, how do you sleep at night when your heart is so filled with hate? And here's another fun thing about living in the age of corporate wokesterism. We are not even allowed to say people got fired 
anymore. So that wild-eyed lunatic Bud Light marketing VP, the one who managed to completely destroy a venerable century-old American brand in 72 hours or less by engineering the Dylan Mulvaney fiasco, she got fired because, of course, she got fired. But we are not allowed to say she got fired. We have to pretend she has taken a leave of absence. Because you know how it is, sometimes right after you commit an epoch-shatteringly stupid professional blunder that totally wrecks the future of the company you work for, that is when you just happen to decide, you know, I, th I think I need to take a step back for a while and spend some more time with my family. But that is the absurd clown show that we live in now. Somebody screws the pooch, wrecks the company, gets fired, but we have to pretend they didn't get fired. Because if we call things what they are, well, that could open us up to other people calling other things what they are. If we say, well, we fired this person because she was terrible at her job and she ruined the brand forever, that might cause somebody to ask why we hired her in the first place when she was so obviously incompetent. And we have no good answer for that question except the true answer. We hired her because she ticked off multiple intersectional woke boxes on the list that needed to be ticked because the, the diversity and inclusion department was breathing down our necks saying we better not hire any more straight white dudes. And of course that's probably the most delicious aspect of this whole ridiculous woke feedback loop of watching the snake of wokesterism furiously devouring its own tail. Pick whatever metaphor you like, really. Because once you start hiring people for important positions based on their woke intersectional characteristics and bona fides, you can't ever fire them. At least not without exposing yourself to charges of all manner of istophobia, because I'm telling you right now. If Anheuser-Busch had simply come out and said, we fired this idiot because she ruined the company, everybody in the Twitter rage mob would declare the company misogynist. And those are the only people who are still buying their shitty beer at this point, frankly, so tread lightly, I guess. But I guess the, the, the more heads... They needed more, more than one head to roll. So within hours of the woke chick getting fired, the guy in charge of her got fired too. And yes, we are playing the involuntary, voluntary leave of absence game with him too. What an uncanny coincidence that is, that these two people should suddenly decide on the same day that they both really need to take some time off to spend with their families. What, what, what a most serendipitous confluence of events that is. It's like the time I won the Powerball jackpot while getting struck by lightning, while getting tossed off by Scarlett Johansson. Call me Scarlett, miss you. And that thing with the Patriot porn video. Just, God, what are you guys doing? When you look up cartoonishly bad attempts at corporate damage control in the Encyclopedia of Human Ineptitude, in the next edition, that whole entry is going to be about Bud Light. So just for fun, let's quickly recap how the Anheuser-Busch damage control response has played out. First, the CEO issues a classic non-apology apology in which he dithers and prevaricates and stammers some nonsense about how we never wanted to be part of a conversation that divides people. It's difficult to imagine that people who do marketing for a living actually thought that was going to fix this thing, but evidently they did. Because they gave it a good 48 hours, during which time the boycott only grew in strength and severity. So then you get to the big Twitter Patriot porn video of last Wednesday, I think it was. I heard somebody say, and I wish I had thought of this line myself, that it looked like if you if you asked ChatGPT to make you a video and the only prompt you give it was, America, patriotism, I'm sorry, this video is exactly what you would have gotten. It's probably not too far off. And with each comically clumsy attempt at corporate damage control, the great Budweiser boycott of 2023 only got bigger and stronger. I don't know about anybody else, but I've been making a mental note to glance at the stock each time I'm in a convenience store or a grocery store, and I've grown pretty accustomed to seeing the Bud Light shelf always fully stocked. And that is here in woke Southern California, so if it's that severe here, I imagine it's more severe pretty much everywhere else. And that is a good and proper thing. You've heard me say before that the era of corporate wokesterism is not going to go by the wayside until major brands start getting ruined by it. And I would submit that's what we're starting to see now. Would it matter if the damage control response by Anheuser-Busch had been less clumsy than it was in the event? 
No, it wouldn't matter in the slightest. Would it matter if there had been an actual apology instead of a stupid half-assed non-apology? No, that wouldn't matter either. If Bud Light has chosen itself for the honor of being the major American brand that commits woke self seppuku on the altar of transgenderism, then let them be that brand. And similarly, if Disney wants to walk that same path and use its 100 plus years of cultural capital to promote weird, freaky sex fetishes, let their brand be ruined too. But if one or both of those brands actually goes under, I guarantee you will never see a woke TV commercial ever again as long as you live. Consumer brands are only institutions when we, the consumers, allow them to be that. Just as governments derive their lawful power from the consent of the governed, brand names derive their survival from the consent of the consumer. And the consumer can revoke that consent at any time and place of his own choosing just by choosing to buy a different brand of beer. There is great peril, and this is something you've also heard me say before, in making consumer brands into cultural institutions. When it happens, we do not prosper for it, either as a people or as a culture. What we see in case after case is brands spending their cultural capital on trying to destroy the values and the principles that they built the brand on in the first place and dedicated themselves to upholding and preserving. You have fond memories of watching Disney movies as, as a child, and the people who run Disney today have weaponized that nostalgia in order to turn your kids gay and trans without, hopefully, you ever noticing. Disney and Budweiser earned their cultural capital by building their brands to be a reflection of the, of the values that their customers held dear, but that's all been inverted 180 degrees now. Today, those companies want to shape your values rather than reflecting them, whereas before, Bud Light would put an American flag on the can for the 4th of July because our brand is here to affirm and support the values of you, the consumer. Now you get Dylan Mulvaney's face on the can because our brand is here to make sure that you conform with our values because we don't want you to be a filthy, bigoted transphobe. You see how that works? Also, one last thing. Whoever it is who keeps calling me from Fox News, please just stop. I have no interest in taking over the Tucker Carlson time slot. Besides, you could never satisfy my list of demands. I need a hair and makeup girl who's also a military history major, and if you ain't got one, that's a deal breaker. I also have entirely too much self-respect to ever work in cable news, and while I am flattered by your entreaties, I am afraid the answer is a firm no. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Have a pleasant tomorrow. Do not comply. Get off my lawn.